All right, let's have a look at uh, work done by conservative forces and non-conservative forces and see how those things differ. So we've seen that energy is an accounting system. Sorry, I'm just going to move this screen down a little bit. We've seen that energy is an accounting system that just keeps track of how much energy things have and how much uh, ability they have to do work. The unit of energy is the joule, and that energy comes in many forms. We've got kinetic energy, we've got electrical energy, um, magnetic energy, thermal energy, nuclear energy, gravitational potential energy, and so on. Uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but uh, it can be lost due to non-useful forms such as sound and heat. And when we do lose energy in that way, when energy is dissipated in a non-retrievable form, we call that entropy. Formulas we've seen so far, work is force times distance, or more specifically, work is force in the direction of motion, so F cos theta d, where uh, cos theta is the angle between the direction of motion and the force. Uh, we've seen the kinetic energy is half mv squared, and we've seen that the work done by a net force, that is, take all the sum of forces together, so we look at the, the whatever net force there is, work done by the net force produces a change in kinetic energy. And we've also seen that potential energy is MGH. We saw that in the last video. So, here's a question. If I have a, a one kilogram mass and I launch it upwards with an initial uh, energy of 9.8 joules, so that energy would be in the form of kinetic energy, what happens to the potential energy and the kinetic energy uh, as it rises? And then so on its way up, and then what happens on its way down. Okay. So what's going to happen? As it goes up, obviously it's going to slow down because gravity is acting on it until it comes to a stop, and then it's going to speed up again. So what's happening? As it goes up, because it's slowing down, the kinetic energy is going down, but the potential energy is going up. The opposite is true on the way down, where it starts from rest, so kinetic energy of zero, and then as it falls, the potential energy goes down and the kinetic energy goes up. So we've got this kind of even-steven thing. As one form of energy decreases, the other form of energy increases so that the total energy of the system with those two combined remains the same. Sorry. The second energy here is if, um, if I do 9.8 joules of work bringing it up from the table and I let it go, how much energy, how much kinetic energy will it have when it falls back and hits the table? Well, we've seen that as the potential energy falls and kinetic energy rises, when it gets to the table, then all of the energy will be in the form of kinetic energy, so once again it will have 9.8 joules. Okay, so the total energy remains constant. So the sum of those two energies, potential energy and kinetic energy, is going to be the same. So we use the term total mechanical energy to describe the sum of all types of energy that uh, an object or a system has. So that can be kinetic energy, rotational energy, uh, potential energy, gravitational, elastic, um, electric energy, and so on. Typically, in uh, introductory mechanics courses, we're looking at the combination of kinetic energy and potential energy, and that's really what we're going to focus on here. So the total mechanical energy of uh, an object or a system is its, the sum of its kinetic energy and its potential energy. Now, if I do 9.8 joules of work sliding this mass across the table, uh, what happens when I let it go? Obviously nothing happened. So the, what's the difference between that and, and doing 9.8 joules to lift it up? And we saw in the previous video that the difference is that one is using conservative forces and the other is non-conservative forces. Okay, so a quick overview of those two things. And I'm just going to move me up here. So with uh, conservative forces, things like gravity and springs and 
uh, magnets and so on, it can, we've seen that it can store energy, whereas non-conservative forces like friction and thrust, the energy is lost to, uh, to entropy. It's not stored as potential energy. Now, here's a couple of interesting things. If I lift the mass up, it doesn't matter if I lift it straight up or if I lift it in a roundabout sort of way, the path to get from here to here is unimportant. Really, the only work done on it is against gravity, so it's only the vertical component of its motion that gives any kind of, uh, uh, or requires any kind of work. Whereas with friction, friction is a non-conservative force, and if I move from point A to point B in a straight line versus in a zigzag line, the amount of work done is not the same. The zigzag line is a longer path, and so there's more work done. So the, the work is dependent on the path taken for conservative forces, but not for non-conservative forces. Um, if we have a, a system like a, like a Ferris wheel, where something goes around, it comes back to the starting point. Again, with a conservative force, we're back to our initial position, so our total work done is zero, because work done against gravity and then work done by gravity, so total work done is zero. However, with uh, non-conservative forces like friction, moving around in a circle, because the work done is dependent on the path length, work is done, so the total work done on the object is not zero. If we have only conservative forces at play, then there is no change in the total energy. So the energy is just switching between potential and kinetic. If we have non-conservative forces, then we are changing the total amount of energy in the system. Work done by non-conservative forces causes a change in total energy. So we can either add energy to the system or take energy away, but work done by a non-conservative force will change the total energy of the system. In other words, we've got this even-steven thing with potential energy and kinetic energy. If there's, if there's non-conservative forces in there, there's going to be extra energy put into the system or energy taken out of the system, and we're going to throw off that balance. So looking at these equations here, we can see that uh, work done by non-conservative forces causes a change in energy, or we can break it down to its components and say that non-conservative forces, work done by non-conservative forces, is equal to all of the final energies put together minus all of the initial energies. So, if there is no non-conservative work, or WNC is equal to zero, then the final energy is going to be equal to the initial energy, and that's when we're going to have our energy being conserved. So, if there is no work done by non-conservative forces, total mechanical energy, that is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies, remains the same for the system. So let's look at an example. A cyclist approaches the bottom of a let's, example. Let's look at an example. Uh, a cyclist approaches the hill at 11 meters per second. The hill is five meters high. The cyclist estimates that she is going fast enough to coast up and over it without pedaling, ignoring air resistance and friction. Yeah, like that ever happens. Anyway, ignoring air resistance and friction, find the speed at which the cyclist crests the hill. Okay, so let's break this down. So, we're ignoring air resistance and friction, so there are no non-conservative forces. So the final energy is going to be equal to the initial energy. So the sum of potential and kinetic energies at the end is going to be equal to the sum of potential and kinetic energies at the beginning. 
So the formula is mgh plus half mv squared for each final initial. Okay. Now, the neat thing is here, we don't have any of the masses, right? We don't have the mass of the cyclist or the mass of the bicycle. But it doesn't matter because mass is in all the terms that cancels out and we wind up with this. So we can scratch the mass from the formula, which is kind of cool. Okay, so we just kind of keep working through it and we don't have any initial potential energy either. If we're starting at the bottom of the hill, we can call that zero and then there's only height at the top of the hill. So there's another term we can remove and we wind up with that half of the final velocity, or half of the square of the final velocity is equal to half of the initial uh, velocity squared uh, minus the uh, GHF. Okay. And then we just plug in our numbers and we can solve for our final velocity, which comes out to 4.8 meters per second. So let's look at another example. Uh, if we have a let's look at another example. If we fire a slingshot uh, or fire a pebble from a slingshot from the top of a building with a speed of 14 meters per second, the building is 31 meters tall. Ignoring air resistance, find the speed with which the pebble strikes the ground when fired horizontally, vertically. Uh, straight up and vertically straight down. Now, if we were doing this with kinematics, you would probably come at me with pitchforks and firebrands because I'm asking you to solve the same question three times. And we'll see that using energy, uh, we don't have to. It's the same question. So in this case, because we're dealing with energy, energy is a scalar. It has no direction. It's not a vector. So it doesn't really matter which direction we're launching the ball or launching the marble. It has initial potential energy. It has initial kinetic energy. The direction of, uh, uh, in which it's launched is really completely irrelevant. So we have our final energy is equal to our initial energy. Um, there's no final potential energy because it's at ground level. There's no, uh, oh, there is initial kinetic energy. Okay, so again, we can cancel out the M's uh, and then expand and we simply solve for our velocity, it's 28.35 meters per second. And it doesn't matter whether the, the marble is launched horizontally and hits the ground, or if it's launched straight up and back down or launched down. In all cases, it has the same initial potential energy and the same initial kinetic energy. And so it has the same final kinetic energy, so it has the same final speed. Now, in the case of going vertically, that speed will be straight down. In the case of being launched horizontally, the speed will be downwards on an angle. Um, and using kinematics, we would have to find the x and y components and add those together and use Pythagoras and so on. But using the work in energy, it doesn't matter. It's the speed. The speed is going to be the same, but it's just going to be on an angle instead of straight down. So when we're solving uh, questions for mechanical energy, some things to keep in mind. We want to uh, identify the forces. We want to identify forces uh, as being conservative or non-conservative. Um, if we're dealing with conservation of energy, then there has to be no non-conservative forces. Okay, So non-conservative forces or the sum of non-conservative forces must be zero. Uh, we want to choose some reference point for potential energy. Often we will use uh, ground level or whatever sort of if it's something falling, we'll use the final position uh, as zero. Um, if we're moving upwards, whatever, we may use the initial condition. But often it's ground level is zero, um, but just some useful reference point for, uh, for that. And um, since energy is conserved, we simply make the final uh, total energy, mechanical energy, equal to the initial total mechanical energy. Now, let's look at this problem. Okay, so we have a ball rolling down uh, a ramp, hitting another ramp, and then undergoing projectile motion to land on the ground. Now, if I gave you that question when we're dealing with kinematics, again, pitchforks and firebrands, 
you would be after me and I would probably not survive the day. But this is work and energy. So what's going on here? We have this marble starting from rest. It's rolling down a ramp, it's accelerating, it's hitting another ramp, it's going for a jump, it's undergoing projectile motion. But let's look at how we would solve this with kinematics versus work and energy. Okay, Using kinematics, we would have to find the slope of the ramp. We would have to determine the acceleration of the marble down the ramp. We would have to find the launch angle. We would have to calculate projectile motion. We would have to solve for the final x and y velocities, and we would have to use Pythagorean theorem to add those together to get the final speed, by which time you would be half dead of exhaustion. When we're using work and energy, we know that the final energy is equal to the initial energy. We also know that there is no initial kinetic energy. Initially, all the energy is potential. And at the end, it's at ground level, there is no potential energy, all the energy is kinetic. So the final kinetic energy is equal to the initial potential energy. We just plug in the values, half mvf squared equals mgh. The m's cancel out, and we're left with vf squared is equal to 2gh. We have one simple little formula that we can use to figure out the final speed of the marble versus all of this. And that's why I think the equations of work and energy are really, really cool.